Hello, and welcome to Bible Questions TV, the show that tries to answer the really difficult questions about the Bible. If you have any questions of your own, you can go to our website, BibleQuestions.tv, and submit a question. We'll answer every question that comes in, and we'll even use some of them as topics for future episodes of Bible Questions TV. In this episode, we're going to play two clips for you. The first is called UFOs and Ancient Art Debunked. It is a refutation of a theory that we hear all the time, the idea that artists throughout history have depicted UFOs in their paintings. It's promoted by networks like the History Channel as being authentic when the truth is that the so-called mysterious objects in these paintings are well known, understood by art critics, and to them this theory is very ridiculous. The clip we will play after that one is called Victor's Story. It's a short video made from an interview we did with a man named Victor about a year ago. It's a very interesting story, and if you like it, we encourage you to listen to the entire audio interview online for free at our website, BibleQuestions.tv. So without any more delay, here is the first clip, UFOs and Ancient Art Debunked. For years, many people have posted pictures of what appear to be UFOs in art as proof that there has been visitation from spacecraft for at least several hundred years. I will be reading from an excellent website by an Italian art critic, Diego Cuoghi, who has systematically pointed out in his research that this is totally untrue. In this short video, I will be dealing with three or four of the more famous ones, but if you have others that you are unsure about, you can visit his website in the description section of this video. You may need to use Google or some other program to have them translated to English, however. I will also say before we get started that I personally don't like this style of art commissioned by the Catholic Church, and while their symbolism is sometimes unbiblical, the fact is that it was at least well understood at the time. Number 1. Crucifixion in Spezdizi Covelli Cathedral in Georgia This crucifixion, located on one side of the grave of Sidonia in Spezdizi Covelli Cathedral, and it is one of the most widely known cases of the misunderstanding of an artwork. It has been published on many UFO web pages, but those who are familiar with symbolism in medieval art understand that there are no mysterious elements in this painting. In fact, in most of the crucifixion scenes done in the Byzantine style, they show the same objects on either side of the cross. They are the sun and the moon, often represented with a human face or figure. Here is a small sample of crucifixions in the Byzantine style, showing the sun and the moon with human attributes. But not only in Byzantine Orthodox icons do we find the sun and the moon in crucifixions. They are also found in the work of painters like Duar, Crivelli, Raffaello, Bramantino, and others. Conclusion This crucifixion contains no UFOs. The two objects near the cross are the anthropomorphic representations of the sun and the moon, shown in much the same way as in many Byzantine crucifixions. Crucifixion in the Vasky Dekani Monastery in Kosovo. This 16th century crucifixion, a fresco in the Viskoski Dekani Monastery, is like the previous one, considered a UFO painting. The two strange objects at the sides of the cross are considered to be UFOs. This is one of the oldest documented UFO in art cases, because the first articles about it were published in the 60s in the French magazine Sputnik. The fresco was, quote, discovered by Alexander Panovich, a student at the Academy of Arts in Yugoslavia in 1964. After this early publicity, the pictures were featured in many books about UFOs. On many web pages, we read that the two objects in the sky are, without a doubt, spaceships with crew. But this crucifixion also follows the common iconographic model of the Middle Ages. The, quote, deposition from the cross of Benedetto Antolami in the Dome of Parma in particular resembles the crucifixion of Isaki Dekani. On the edges of the composition, in the same position as in the fresco of Vizaki Dekani, the sun and the moon are represented as human witnesses to the crucifixion, just as they are in the previous painting. In both artwork, the figures who represent the sun and the moon look towards the cross that is located in the center of the composition. The sun and the moon, represented as human figures, are visible in many Byzantine Orthodox sacred paintings, including the treasure of St. Clement and modern Byzantine frescoes. James Hall, author of Dictionary of Subjects and Symbols in Art, writes, The sun and the moon on each side of the cross are regular features of medieval crucifixions. They survived into the early Renaissance but are seldom seen after the 15th century. Often the sun and the moon were represented as human characters, driving wagons drawn by horses and by oxen, as in this ivory bas relief, the binding of the Book of Percopi of Henry II from the 11th century. A sculpture by Benedetto Antolami in the Dome of Parma with the story of Barlaam and Josephi 
where the sun and the moon appear to be doubled in figures of fighting day and night. Conclusion. In the Vizaki Dakani crucifixion fresco, there are no UFOs. The two objects near the cross are the anthropomorphic symbols of the sun and the moon, represented in much the same way as they are in many other Byzantine crucifixions. Next is Madonna con Bambino e Sano Giovanno. This is the painting that more than any other has sparked discussions among ufologists who see in the upper right scene behind the Madonna the proof of a close encounter with an unidentified flying object. In the above mentioned scene we see a character keeping a hand to his forehead and looking towards an apparition in the sky. With him there is a dog who also looks towards the strange object. We see that this is to be found in many nativities of the 1400s and 1500s. It is but the announcement to the shepherds as told in St. Luke's Gospel. And there were many in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord come upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear ye not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Here we see two shepherds in many places looking to the angel coming out from the cloud. We can see this scene represented in much the same way of the Madonna with child, and in many other paintings of the Nativity or the Adoration of the Child. These are but a few examples taken from dozens of paintings of the Nativity of Christ, and every one we clearly recognize the angel and see that almost always there is one shepherd holding his hand to his forehead as if shielding his eyes from the light of the glory of the Lord, referred to in the above quote from the Gospel. Often there will also be a dog looking toward the apparition. In many cases the angel comes out of the cloud, lined by light, or in older pictures by golden rays. In this picture we see that an angel appears through a light tear in the sky, while in the Madonna and Child with the infant St. John by Raffaellino, there is only a luminous tear in a big cloud. Also, I feel conclusively, in another tondo attributed to the same artist, it shows the same scene of a shepherd who with his hand to his forehead and a dog at his side looks towards an apparition of a red-dressed angel. And in the center, above the Madonna's head, there is the same light rayed cloud. Here is a nativity from Ghirlandaio, with a bright star appearing inside a cloud. And on a hill at the right, the angel appears to the shepherds. Here we find both the angel and the luminous cloud. Also in this nativity, from the Book of Prayers, we recognize the luminous cloud full of little angels. In this nativity, we find the same cloud over the Madonna, while the angel comes out of a similar cloud to make his announcement to the shepherds. We can therefore safely identify the Madonna and child with the infant St. John as the same announcement scene which is described in the Gospel of Luke. The Baptism of Christ, or Art de Gelder. It is really difficult to understand what may have prompted many ufologists to claim that this painting would have been an unidentified flying object, because no one ever gives a magnification of or a decent picture, and it is always plain in small dimensions. Here is a good magnification. This picture represents the baptism of Christ, so we can compare it with many others representing the same scene described in the Gospels. In all four versions, God is witness to the scene of the baptism. And coming from the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from the clouds, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. It says, I saw a Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. The Holy Spirit, as a dove, is often depicted in a circle from which light rays that symbolize the divine grace emanate around it. Here we see the classic representation of the third person of the Trinity comes from the dispute of the sacrament by Raphael and the baptism of Christ by Pugrino. Even in the painting of de Gelder, at the center of the circle of light is a small dove, or the Holy Spirit. In the foreground of a hilly landscape, Christ is baptized by St. John amid a circle of onlookers. The two figures are brilliantly lit by rays of light from high above. Here are several other examples of the baptism of Christ, and in many cases it is the same. God the Father is to be shown on top of the dove in a circle of clouds or light in the sky. The Tomb of Tahotep in Saqqara, Egypt. It's from the 5th or 6th dynasties in ancient Egypt, around 2400 BC. 
Many people and videos and websites have used this image as proof that ancient Egyptians were in contact with extraterrestrials. One website reads like this, The implications of the discovery of this ancient stone picture that includes the alien are absolutely huge and could be one of the most important clues to alien intervention into our ancient history ever made. This picture could explain why the Egyptians appeared to be so technologically advanced and how they were able to build the pyramids with such precision. Unfortunately, for those that are so excited for this discovery of a portrait of a gray in an Egyptian tomb, it is not an alien. In fact, a picture book titled All of Egypt by Bonici Ed contains a much more detailed image of the same stone. This is a jar containing a plant that was offered to the gods along with fruit and animals. Also, in other parts of the tomb of Tahotep, there is depicted the same plant. The carrier even has in his hand a small jar of the same form of the alien. Other vases, similar to the one mistaken for an alien, can be seen in this painting that depicts a ritual banquet. In conclusion, this is not depicting an alien gray or a reptilian. In fact, the photos published in many web pages show a range of gifts for a banquet of the gods. In particular, the eyes of the alleged alien are the leaves of a very particular plant that comes from a very particular jar. Pharaoh's Helicopter there are some very strange hieroglyphics in the Temple of Osiris at Abydos. According to many UFO enthusiasts and Atlantis proponents, these glyphs depict highly developed crafts, specifically a helicopter, a submarine, some sort of flying saucer, and a jet plane. What are these inscriptions all about? The glyphs are a result of both erosion of the stone surface, evident elsewhere in the temple, and a process of filling in and re-carving the stone to replace some of the original hieroglyphics. The technical term for such a surface that has been written on more than once is a palimpsest. The usurping and modifying of inscriptions was common in ancient Egypt throughout their history. The Abydos glyph was modified at least once in antiquity, and perhaps twice. Some of the filling has fallen out in places where the older and the newer inscriptions overlap, and the result is unique and odd-looking. The text is part of the titlery of Ramses II and can be translated as the one of the two ladies who suppresses the nine foreign countries. This replaces the royal titlery of Seti I that was originally carved in the stone. More technically, the actual helicopter seems to be a portion of the PSD.T sign and the X3S.T sign on top of each other. If the ancient Egyptians had vehicles such as helicopters, submarines, and jet airplanes, one would expect to find some evidence of this other than a single inscription on a lintel of a single temple. This type of large machinery requires a vast amount of support, including fuel, parts, factories, etc. But there is no trace of any such support in all of Egypt. The Egyptian literature is also bereft of any boast, much less any passing mention of advanced aircraft. Last January, um, yeah, I'll even say it was on Martin Luther King Day. This is what happened. This is one of the craziest things that's ever happened to me in my whole entire life. Um, I was ret I had to return a video camera downtown Chicago, and that's about a 40-minute drive for me. And I had both my daughters because school was out. And we were getting in the car, and I got to return the camera, and there's a blizzard. And I'm talking, you know, inches of snow, Chicago blizzard. It's not the kind of, you don't want to take your kids on the highway for, for a, a joyride. So I got to take this camera back or I'm going to get dinged hundreds of dollars. It was a, a very expensive high definition camera. So I get in the car and we're driving and I always take the same road to Chicago. And I'm on the road and, she, and God is telling me to take a different way, to take the long way, to take the toll way. And this is six miles out of my way and I got to pay like $5 in tolls and that makes absolutely no sense because there's a snow plow in front of me and it's going to take even longer because I'm going to be stuck behind a snowplow for five miles. And he's going 10 miles an hour. And I'm wrestling with this, and God keeps saying, go straight, go the long way. So I do it. And now I'm going down the highway. So then I finally get to the highway. I'm so frustrated because it's taking me so much longer. And I get on the tollway, and immediately, as soon as I get on the tollway, there's a, a semi-truck on its side in the median. And the, his, his trailer is on the other side of the expressway blocking all four lanes of traffic. And everyone on my side is just driving past this guy. And I pull over. 
I get out of my truck. I tell my girls to stay in the car. I get out of my truck, and I'm telling you, man, I've never seen an accident this bad. I couldn't eat. The whole roof was, like, sheared off from the, the light pole that had been wrapped around this thing. Uh, the front end is bashed in, and there's blood everywhere. I'm talking, it looks like it, like it hit a deer. There's, like, pine, there's just blood everywhere, man, in the snow. So when you see that red in the white snow, it stops me dead in my tracks because I'm not, I'm not that type of guy. I get squeamish at other people's blood. And I said, dear Lord, this man doesn't even have a head. There's no way he's even alive. And I cannot even take one step closer to that truck because I cannot even bear what that looks like. I said, but God, if you want me over there, I'll go over there. And no sooner did I say that, I saw a hand come out of the wreckage waving for me to come over. So I ran over there. And I had to, I had to climb over this, the railing and climb over the tr into the truck. And I look into the truck, and this guy's face has been rearranged. His jaw is over to the side. The, the piece of bone that's between your mouth and your nose is over to the other side. His cheekbones are crushed in, and there's a hole in his forehead. And his skull is hanging out. And I can practically see his brains, and blood is shooting out with every heartbeat. Okay? And I almost threw up in this guy's face because I have never seen anything that horrible in my entire life. And I said, dear Lord, please, somebody help me. And I started screaming out. And a guy comes up, and he throws his coat. And it was a white lambskin lining, inner lining of the coat. And I looked at the man, and I said, you're not going to get your coat back, friend. And he said, that's fine, take it. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm hanging upside down into this truck, because it's, it's sideways. On, on the driver's side, on the median, on the concrete median, as I've gone through the, through the truck. And this truck is still on, and the wheels are still spinning, and the engine is still shaking. And everyone's standing. Everyone's standing 100 feet away from the thing because they don't know if it's going to explode or what. And I don't. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, "What am I even doing in this thing?" And I put his face in the. Uh, he was pinned in there. I couldn't even see his body. I don't even know if his if he's got internal bleeding. Nothing. I, I don't know. But he's bleeding everywhere. He's bleeding on me. And I I put his face in the in the white lambskin coat. And and I told his brother. I said, "Hey man, I go. My name's Victor, and I'm going to stay with you until the until the paramedics get here. All right." And I'm sitting there, and I'm just holding him, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this man's going to die in my hand. I've never even seen somebody die in my whole life, and this guy's going to die in my hands. W what do you do with someone that's going to die in your hands? Okay, well, you share Jesus with them is what you do. So I just started telling him, hey, man, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? He loves you so much. He sent his only son to die for you. And that's how much he loves you, man. And I just started sharing the love of Jesus with this guy the best I knew how and I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I'll tell you this man I don't know if there was angels in that truck with me but it felt like it and I felt the presence of God in that truck and I'm crying out to God and I don't even remember what I was saying because I'm just speaking in tongues and I'm just pouring out and I'm just crying out to God for the, this whole time and sharing the love of Christ and trying to walk him through this plan of salvation the best I know and then finally, about 15 or 20 minutes later, the paramedics get there, and they're trying to figure out if the truck's going to blow up and what to do and how to get this guy. And they're, you know, they're, they're figuring all that out. And finally, they were able to relieve me and get in there and support his neck and get him kind of supported and figure out how to cut him out. So I get out of there, and I, I'm holding the coat, and I look at the coat, and there's, like, no blood in this thing, man. I'm talking, like, maybe the size of a quarter of blood in this coat. And this guy was bleeding. He bled, he bled like a stuck pig for 30 seconds to a minute. And I held this guy for 20 minutes, and he didn't bleed. And I'm looking at this coat like, what's, what's going on here? This thing should be, this should be a bloodbath. And I'm really confused. And now I'm thinking, now there's condemnation. I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? See, it's always about me. What did I do? Oh, I did it all wrong. I didn't stop the pressure. I screwed up. I didn't do it right. The guy ran out of blood. He died. He couldn't talk. I didn't even know, you know, if he's listening, if he's conscious. I couldn't even tell. So I drive down the highway because I got a video camera to return. That's all I can think about. Now I'm all shaken up. I'm covered in blood. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess he died. So I got my men's group a couple days later, and I tell, I tell them about it. And uh, the next day I get a phone call from one of the brothers in the men's group, and he says, Victor, they're talking about the, car, the truck accident on the radio, not on the secular radio, or on the secular radio, on the country radio station, they're talking about it. They're saying a man, a good Samaritan, stopped. And, 
shared Jesus with a truck driver and he lived. And I said, really? You think they're talking about me? He's like, who else can they be talking about? And they're looking for you. And I said, they're looking for me. Uh, who do I call? I don't know, but they're looking for you. I get another phone call later that day. Victor, have you seen the front page of the newspaper? No, I haven't seen the front page of the newspaper. He's like, you're on the front page of the newspaper. So he sends me it. And the Chicago paper says, we're looking for the Good Samaritan. And it says, a man named Victor stopped and shared Jesus with me. And he saved my life. <laughs> and, man, I'm reading that and I'm just like, golly, he lives. Praise God. So I called the phone number. And I called, and it was the owner of the truck driver, the owner of the truck driving company. And I called, and I said, hi, my name is Victor. And he goes, Victor, we've been looking for you. We want to meet you. I said, sure. So I come down to the hospital, and I bring two of my brothers with me. And uh, there's 15 people waiting in the hospital room, waiting to meet me, shake my hand and take me. And I brought a Bible, and I read the Good Samaritan parable. Since the newspaper was calling me a good Samaritan, I figured I'd share that. And I read that. And that's what we're called to be. We're called to stop. I think back at how many times I've seen an accident, and I was too worried about where I had to be. And I kept driving. I figured somebody else has got it. You know what? I got the Lord Jesus Christ living in me, man. I need to be stopping for every car accident. Because I have the power inside of me. God wants to use you and me. He wants to use everybody listening to this right now. He wants to use you. He wants you to heal the sick. Yeah, God could use angels, but he doesn't use angels. He uses us. It's our job to, to bring forth the good news of Jesus Christ. It's our job to bring healing. He can do it but without us, but he chooses to use us. He, wants, he loves us. He wants to include us. Being a Christian is exciting. If, it's, if your Christian walk is boring, you're doing something wrong. Ever since I started walking this out, it's been the most exciting, craziest stuff ever. Let me tell you how much, so the guy's name is Keith. So I got to tell him how much God loved him. This is how much God loves Keith, all right? When I first moved to Chicago, the day I walked into my house, a guy knocked on the door and wanted to sell me a security system. I told him to get lost, and he gave me, he gave me his business card. I told him I'd call him back. So I called him back to tell him to get lost. But I got his voicemail, and his voicemail said, Praise Jesus, thank you for calling me. And I had to change of heart, and I said, Hey, why don't you come over? The guy came over and I said, hey, what's up with you loving Jesus? He, and he shared his whole testimony how he got delivered from drugs. And he told me what church to go to. And I went to that church. And there I made my, and at that church, I became friends with a brother named Quentin. And he be, quickly became my best friend. He asked me. And he was the praise and worship leader. And he'd been praying, praying for somebody to come in there and fix the sound system. And that's what I was doing. God, when I walked in that church, God told me to fix the sound system. So I started fixing the sound system. He said, you've been a blessing to me. You're an answer to prayer. Why do you come to this church? I said, a couple months ago, a guy, ADT salesman, told me to come here. And he said, is his name Dave? I said, yeah. He goes, oh, hallelujah. I haven't been Dave for years. He's like, I was worried that he was back on drugs. I go, no, he's praising me. He loves the Lord. He told me to come here. He said, he said a couple years ago, Dave was going to go to jail. I didn't know Dave. He showed up to my work site, and he asked for $4,000 or else he was going to prison. God told me to give him $4,000, so I did. Quentin gave Dave, a stranger, $4,000, and Dave came back and worked off every penny. And God repaid Quentin for his obedience and, and brought us together. So Quentin got lost one day in, a, in, in Wisconsin, and he got lost in the man's parking lot. And there was a, a phone number on the, on the sign that said, Wild Heart Ministries for Men. And Quentin said, I want to find some real men. And he called the phone number. To this day, he's the only man to ever call that phone number. And the, the man that answered, his name was Bob. And Bob and Quentin and I are best friends now. And when God called me into the wilderness, he called Quentin at the same time. And he also called Bob. And we all met each other when we were just coming out into the wilderness. And Bob invited me over to his house. And I met Bob. And I was at Bob's house. And I met a young brother that wanted to become a rapper. And he had heard that I had made a rap video that was on BET. So he said, you know what, I'm going to make a rap video one day with you. And I said, fine, here's my card. One year later, he called me, and he said, it's time to make a rap video. And I said, you know what, I don't know if it is, because I just gave my business away. When I moved back to Chicago, God told me to give my business away to my employee. He's been a faithful, hardworking person. And I gave my entire business, all the cameras, all the equipment, all the clientele, everything, gave it to him. And David is... He's a great brother. He didn't know the Lord 
when he started working for me, but he did by the time he was done working for me. And now he's running my my old business, and I was good, and I was done with the video business. But God told me to make the rap video. So because I'd given my video cameras away, I had to go rent a video camera. I went and rented a video camera. And that's why I had to go on 94 to return a video camera. And that's how much God loves Keith, the truck driver. And that all those things had, all those things happened. All these impossibilities were be, became possible because of just following God, listening to God's voice. You know, I've learned to live a lifestyle of fasting and praying finally. And you know what? I'm starting to hear God. And I used to hear people say, oh, God told me this, God told me that. And I used to think they were crazy. But you know what? I'm starting to become one of those crazy people because I'm starting to desire the things of God far more than the things of flesh. And uh, I wouldn't have it any other way, man. If you're a new Christian or somebody that's just interested in learning more about Christianity, I want to send you a free copy of something that I've been calling the Christianity 101 DVDs, which you can get free at our website, BibleQuestions.tv. Basically, it's a data DVD. What that means is that it works like a flash drive. You pop it into your computer, you open it up, and you see all these files. I've put MP3s, movies, eBooks, audiobooks, just all kinds of stuff. In fact, four gigs of material that I think will really help you grow. It's totally free. There's literally no obligation. I do this because Jesus said in the Great Commission to make disciples of all men. So you can go to our website, BibleQuestions.tv, click on the Christianity 101 banner, and tell me where to send it. And it doesn't matter what country you live in. I'll ship it to you for free wherever you are. So there's two ways to order one. You can first go to the website, BibleQuestions.tv, and click the banner. Or you can physically write me at Chris White Ministries, P.O. Box 110984, Nashville, Tennessee, 37211. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching Bible Questions TV. If you want to see more about the video we were just watching, you can go to our website, BibleQuestions.tv. While you're there, you can order a free copy of the Christianity 101 DVD, or you can write to us at the address on your screen. Thanks to Chris White, Adam Larson, and Kneecat Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Samuel H. Bolton, and we'll see you next time.